Obama. I told you this story in private correspondence. I'll repeat it here. The campaign of 2008, Obama is selling the country on hope and change, and we are the ones we've been waiting for. <laughs> as vapid as you could possibly imagine in retrospect, but it actually persuaded a majority of voters to cast ballots on his behalf in 2008. And, uh, but so he's, he's uh, on the rise, uh, but not yet nominated. And uh, a black, brilliant undergraduate student of mine at Brown, who I'll not name, comes to me and he whispers, he says, is Obama a pimp? And I say, what? What? He says, because he's mind fucking all of us. <laughs> and I said, hmm, that's something to think about. You said it, I didn't, but that's something to think about. I was reminded of this kid when I read your long chapter on Obama. So Obama is now St. Obama. Uh, he and Michelle are billionaires or as close to that as you could imagine. And here you are, Mr. Contrarian out there saying, saying what? What are you saying about Obama? The first thing is to say what you just said as having been acknowledged by Obama. When you read his memoir, he says in the 2008 election, I pulled off, and I'm using his expression, a neat trick. That's <laughs> 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 the, the phrase he uses, a neat trick. And the neat trick was, I stood for absolutely nothing, and I managed to get myself elected, obviously by virtue of being a black man. I mean, first of all, it takes a certain amount of lack of self-aware brazenness to boast, to boast about the fact that you got elected standing for nothing. It's as if John F. Kennedy were to write his memoir, I got elected because of my thick shock of hair. <laughs> Which, he, by the way, it's reported he combed 40 times a day, but we'll leave that aside. Uh, to boast about that, and then at another point, he calls himself, Obama calls himself, the ultimate Rorschach test. Everybody saw what they wanted to see in me. I stood for nothing. There was an element of, as I say, lack of self-aware cynicism. That was really quite striking. Let, let, let me beg to differ just a minute. He, he stood for... I am the first black president. That's not nothing. That's correct. That's correct. What he did was he turned the presidential election into a morality tale, a referendum, in which each of the electors was called upon to make a moral test. If you are a good person, you vote for Obama. If you are a bad person, you don't vote for Obama. So instead of a presidential election being a referendum on the candidates, is he a good candidate or is he a bad candidate? It became a referendum on the electorate. Are you a good people or are you a bad people? Let me, observe, let me observe that that would only be possible with the ratification of Obama's move, I am the emblem of a virtuous good person's vote, the ratification of that by Black people who might have said, you're a carpetbagger, uh, you don't know anything about our experience, really. This is all symbolism. You and Martin Luther King don't deserve to be in the same frame. Uh, you're, you know, uh, what do you mean taking my noble history of centuries of oppression in this country and appropriating it to your own personal ambition with smoke and mirrors? But we didn't say that. I do, regret, I do regard it as a regrettable fact that because of a kind of racial, if I can use the term, defensiveness, that even to this day, to this day, it's still impossible for a non-white person to say anything 
critical of Obama without then the thought passing through the black person that he or she must be a racist. As I say that defensiveness endures to this day, and I, I can understand it. The great Roman philosopher Terence, he famously said in the Latin, I'll give it in the English version, nothing human is alien to me, which is to say, don't put me on the pedestal. All of the flaws that all of us carry with us, I carry with me. So I will acknowledge that a lot of times when a non-Jewish person gets too carried away in his or her loathing of Israel, I begin to wonder, <laughs> is something else going on there? Are they really indignant about, yes, Israel's policies are murderous, bestial, uh, so forth, but are, is that their only animating sentiment, the injustice? And so I can understand the African-American defensiveness when it comes to uh, criticizing publicly Barack Obama. I get it. And I will say, I recognize I was taking a chance with that chapter. I recognize that. And I said to myself, you know, Norm, a large part of your career was saying a lot of things that Jews did not want to hear. And I commanded a certain amount of immunity because I myself was Jewish and I had, as it were, the Holocaust credentials. And I went after all the icons of the Jewish community and the Holocaust memory like Elie Wiesel and others in my, for example, the Holocaust industry. And so I said to myself, you know, Norm, you earned the right to write what you take to be the truth about this whole mystique that shrouds Obama. And the chapter is evenly ba balanced between Obama himself, as to quote David Garrow, an empty vessel, and all the woke people, the Axelrods, the David Axelrods, the David Pluffs, the uh, Lawrence Tribes, the Martha Minnows, all of those white woke liberals the Ben Rhodes, all of those white woke liberals who created Obama in the most cynical, disingenuous way with people like Lawrence Tribe saying, oh, he's the most brilliant student I've had in 40 years. He knows particle physics. He knows, and I'm not joking, he knows relativity. He knows quantum, quantum physics. Now, you, Glenn Lowry, you, Glenn Lowry, went to MIT. Lawrence Tribe went to Harvard at age 16 and got his degree in mathematics, summa cum laude. Okay? I hear you, man. And he knows math. You know math. Right. Obama never took a math course. And you couldn't, find, you couldn't find this transcript if you went looking for it. Right. But let's leave aside the transcript. We know the courses he took. Yeah. He never took a math course. The closest he took to a science course was a course at Columbia called Physics for Poets. You get me? You yeah, understand I do. that kind of course. Right. A, flaky, <laughs> a flaky course where you can pass your science requirement, physics for poets. Now, is it credible? No, is it's it not. Possible? I put that quote, I put that question to Brianna Joy Gray, who's a very smart young woman. She is. And she studied as an undergraduate at Harvard. She double majored in the history of art and the history of science. And she said, I took a good half of my courses in the hard sciences. 
And I asked Brianna, do you think Obama knows relativity? Now, you know what it means, Glenn, to know relativity? I'll tell you what it means. I was once in a car ride with Professor Chomsky, and we were making small talk, not really talk. I just ask questions, he gives answers. You know, it was like the kid show, Ask Mr. Wizard. I was always asking, so well, one day I'm making, you know, I said, you know, Professor, uh, I ask him, what do you think about Obama? What do you think about uh, Einstein's uh, theory of relativity? Is it all that it's said to be, or is there a certain element of, I can use the crude expression, hype to it? Professor Chomsky turned to me and he said, Norman, first of all, only a handful of people in the world understand the theory of relativity. Only a handful of people understand it. But now to read Lawrence Tribe, and to read David Remnick in his hagiographic biography of Obama, Obama understood relativity. You know, that was the idiotic white liberal yeah. wokeness to make these utterly preposterous claims. And as I said, Rihanna Joy Gray, to her credit, because she's serious, she said, of course he didn't understand relativity, you know? It's a, a completely incredible, preposterous, yeah. ridiculous claim. But the, the, the uh, encomia, this incessant, everyone's saying, he's brilliant, he's brilliant, he's brilliant, he's brilliant. Fine. So I sit down, where is the evidence? He went to law school. He was the editor of um, Harvard Law Review. He wrote one six-page comment on abortion. One six-page comment. That is his complete, total, exhaustive scholarly production. He was up, as you know, they, they were wooing him at University of Chicago to, be at the, to stay at the law school, to give him a tenured position. They were offering him a tenured position when his total scholarly output was one six-page comment in Harvard Law Review. That's it. Now... As you know, Glenn, you're an academic. Maybe the standard is wrong, but you recognize as an academic that the standard typically used to judge somebody's academic brilliance is scholarly production. Yeah, yeah. Let, let, yeah. let me just interject. I mean, I, I don't disagree with anything you're saying here, Norman, but I just want to say this. So there's such a thing as a professor of practice at a professional school like a law school, a school of public policy. You could have somebody get a tenured appointment based upon the value in your pedagogic mission of teaching your students of having real world experience and, you know, mastery over some domain of, of public policy or public action. And I, I'm not saying Obama met that desiderata. I'm saying in principle, you don't have to have books and everything to get tenure in an academic uh, part. If you're, in a, if you're in the presidential administration, you, you can get a job based on your experiences. As yeah, that's a, what I'm saying. Yes. But what was Obama's experience? He was a community organizer for two and a half years. <laughs> that's, that's it. Yeah, and elected to the state legislature. Well, well, the state legislature, you know, the Chicago state, uh, uh, the Illinois no, state. No, I know about that election. <laughs> <laughs> I know how he disqualified the incumbent by because the signatures on the ballot qualification refer, referenda were not all kosher, and uh, he, he was able to walk into that seat basically without opposition. And if you read his descriptions of that period in his life, he seems to have spent a lot of time playing cards, which is understandable in the Illinois State uh, Legislative House. And uh, he put forth some bills, but people who were activists said, he never followed through on the bills. He never did anything with those bills. There was no uh, active, engaged um, involvement in politics because Obama's a completely apolitical uh, creature. He has no interest in politics whatsoever. 